What we're about to see is water that's at high temperatures that is a leak on the system. It's a model stainless steel vessel with a tiny loop and a little hole. So as the water goes into the vessel, the vessel itself is hotter than the boiling point of water. You can contain the water as a liquid with pressure, but the moment that there is a escape opportunity for the water, it will immediately become steam. We're going to observe what happens when we use molten salt for a similar purpose. If that same leak happens with a molten salt reactor, the molten salt is not under any more pressure than it takes to just move it around the loop. And so when it comes out, it just simply falls to the floor where it solidifies and contains the radiation within that solidified salt. So we have a mess to clean up, but the mess is right here at the bottom of the reactor instead of blowing all across the countryside. For the molten salt technology, we're going to rely on molten salt to receive the heat of the fission and then carry that heat through a heat exchanger and allow us to use that to convert it into electricity. For this demonstration, we're using nitrates instead of fluorides. Notice that the salt is very similar as liquid water, but what happens when you pour it? Notice that it immediately freezes. So, if in our reactor we were to have a leak and the salt starts to pour down, the salt would immediately freeze down upon contact with the with a floor or, or with a bottom surface. This is also highly advantageous because we can contain the contamination in just a small area instead of allowing it to spread through the water or the air. Yes, the salt will remain radioactive, but now this radioactivity is contained in a small area over there with the salt instead of being spread in the water or in the air. I'm here with Rusty Towel giving me an early tour of the Next Lab. Well, how do I refer to it? We call a building the Dillard Science Engineering Research Center. Next Lab is the department that works inside of it and it's powered by Natura Resources. How many students that go to your university are aware of this? Is it physically connected to the rest of a university? Yeah, so the main campus is just across the street and so you can see a brand new dorm there that's went up. Everyone knows what's happening here. Uh, this site used to be the student intramural field. There was some heartburn about students losing their intramural field. No, they've got a, a new facility on the north end of, of campus. It's very convenient for students to come over here and work between classes and back and forth. And we have a lot of students working with us. So if I pulled a sample of random students going to Abilene Christian University, what is this building for? What, what do you think I'd hear? Like they're all like, yeah, it's a nuclear reactor. Don't you know? There, there'd be some that would say that. There would be some that say, hey, it's that next lab. There's just some that say it's building that came up on our air mural fields, right? They're aware that ACU is, is working on advanced nuclear and this is the facility that's working on it. Okay, thank you. This is a picture of the reactor enclosure, so some early engineering designs. The reactor enclosure is about 10 feet diameter, 20 feet high. The left-hand column here is a bunch of salt systems. The second column, a bunch of chemistry that's required. The third column is instrumentation, data acquisition, filters, and all this is leading up to the very bottom right, the molten salt research reactor. We can't build one of these things in this country without the permission of the government. We have to go through this hurdle. Is it the most efficient hurdle? Can it be streamlined? We hope for a future, a better licensing process, but what we're doing is we're moving forward right now. And the easiest way to get a reactor license today is to come with a small reactor, a research reactor in particular, and so that's the pathway that Natura Resources and ACU is going. We believe this technology will make the world a better place, and we're not interested in doing it in our grandchildren's lifetimes, but we'd like to do it soon. So this is the Science Engineering Research Center. This is the facility, a $23 million facility that Abilene Christian University built to support this work of developing advanced nuclear to help bless the world. Through this door is where we go from being public spaces to where the, the action happens. And for me to come in now because the, you don't have a reactor built yet, right? Is that absolutely? Absolutely. We don't have the reactor on. In fact, we don't have a license from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to build or operate a reactor yet. Thanks for getting all the doors. You bet. Yeah, this on. is a neat space. 
So this is what makes this facility special. This is where we will build a reactor. We will actually demonstrate the concept of small modular reactors. You build it in a factory where you have high quality and you can imagine assembly line production. You put it on a flatbed truck. We have this large door at the south end of the building here, rolls up, that allows a truck to drive in here. The reactor is lifted up by our 40 ton crane that's overhead and that allows us to move it and we drop it down in this large trench. This trench is 25 feet deep. You can hear the echo in it because it's a large trench. It's got four foot thick concrete, still reinforced concrete walls all around in the bottom and we're gonna put a concrete lid on top of it. You see a, a simple lid that allows us to walk and work on top. When the reactor's in there, this will be a much thicker concrete lid on top of it. And so we have a nice concrete box so whenever I hear concrete and uh, nuclear, I always think to Vogel concrete pour. As it was poured, it was being constantly sampled. And so we have, you know, from every shipment of concrete, we have a sample of the concrete that came out so we can, you know, verify. So it's just the quality assurance. The rebar is closer to the thickness of this bar here. It's huge chunks of steel and it's packed in there. Do you think we can walk down those steps? No, I'm not gonna go do that, sorry. Okay, no worries. What is this? Well, this is just a test setup for a, a lay uh, level detector. So one of the questions we have is um, with a liquid fuel reactor is where is our salt, where's our molten salt in which tank and how are we monitoring where the salt is. Remember the salt is what also holds the fuel. Where is our fuel and how do we know where it is and how much of it in different locations. The level of the salt in different tanks. Not like Oh no, yeah, that's right. Not not is it not is gravity doing its job, but how full or empty is the tank? And so you bounce a radar off the surface of the molten salt and you know how is it a full tank or is it an empty tank or where is it in between? And so is this radar here? So that's radar there and what's being tested is uh, in this particular case is a long straight pipe with a valve in the middle of it. Level sensor the radar is um, electronics and needs to be out of a radiation zone. And so radar we know bounces and bends and so we We've actually done tests with it going through multiple 90 degree corners. Someone said, well, what happens if we put a valve in that pipe? And so that's what's being tested right now is you have a, a two inch valve inside of a stainless steel pipe. Does the presence of that valve throw off the radar sensor? So it's just a simple test here. Is this valve one of the ACU valves that are kind of like custom? No, no, this is an off the shelf valve. Okay. Um, and, and again, this is not a valve that's designed to be in a salt wetted environment or something like that. And obviously this is just a test setup. Yeah to test radar waves bouncing down a pipe. <laughs> These are windows that look through to the control room. So inside there, that dark room is the control room. I should have turned the light before we walked in here. Can I look in like there's nothing to? Yeah, yeah, no, no, we can walk in. Let's just step through the door here real quick and I'll turn the lights so we can not have to stare through the window. Sure. This is where we'll actually control the reactor from. So this would be a very difficult room to get to see at a certain point in time. That's right. Um, at some point, this room will be uh, off limits to general public and even uh, you know visitors will have to be approved. Um, and so we still have this window. We're trying to make things where we can be as transparent as possible. And so this window is actually just outside this extra set of doors we walked through. Why do we walk through so many doors? That will be the licensing boundary. You'll potentially recognize like this drawing is being, this is our molten salt test system that's over in the advanced research center and data coming off of it and different different control screens for different experimental you systems. You should have one blue screen of death. <laughs> yeah, well, I think calming feeling. Is this anything noteworthy, this uh, glass? This building is not licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's licensed by the city of Abilene. And so standard fire codes, et cetera, apply. There is an allowance for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to license a research reactor in a multi-use facility. That's what we have here, mm -hmm. is a pre-existing multi-use facility that we custom made to be an advanced reactor facility. So can you define what a multi-use facility is? Is that just mean more than one reactor or is that some broader term? Um, th this is the term that was used in the Atomic Energy Act. Um, so in the 1950s when it was uh, written. You're using licensing rules that were written in the 50s? We had the Atomic Energy Act and then later that was updated multiple times and we went from having the, the Atomic Energy Agency, which had sort of a function, a multi-purpose function of both 
supporting and research and regulating nu uh, nuclear to the splitting those functions up. So the Department of Energy got more of the, the research side and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's got the regulatory side. And so that, that's the origin of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was a modification to the original Atomic Energy Act. And they're still valid today and there's lots of things that we cite and we lean back to the original Atomic Energy Act. Um, they allow for universities to build a research reactor in, in pre-existing multi-use buildings. And so this building does a variety of research. We walk by a bunch of different research labs um, and so this is a, a lot of things will happen in this building other than a, a research reactor. I thought multi-purpose meant you had to build two reactors. <laughs> no, so there's not a requirement. Now, obviously the trench is long enough that we have the ability to build uh, multiple reactors in here and uh, that would have to be all licensed individually uh, with, from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So a uh, one license doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want forever. We'll get a license to build a reactor. We'll get an operating license that allows us to turn on and operate that reactor. At the end of that life, if we wanted to turn it off and then get a second license or a license modification, then we could we could extend the research that happens in this facility by looking at another reactor. Can you build two reactors at once? Can you go, I, instead I, of sequentially, can you have parallel? There's nothing that says you can't do that. What you have to do is you have to say you're going to keep them both safe. And no matter what sort of accident might happen with one, would it be guaranteed that the other one would. So when we think about you know, what happens if there's an earthquake or a tornado or an airplane hits this building, we'd also be concerned with what happens if there was an accident in one reactor and there was a leak or a whatever, a malfunction, would that then cause an accident in the other? When you decommission your reactor, you're going to want to pick it apart and check everything. Eh? It's like that's part of the chemistry, uh, the learning of the chemistry. A lot of the chemistry will learn as we go, right? I mean, and that's the idea is that we, we take a salt sample and that is, I mean, that's like taking a blood test from a, from a you know, a, when you go see a doctor, he takes your blood, he's able to learn all sorts of things about you. Just imagine with a molten salt reactor, if we take a little sample of the salt, we're seeing how is the fuel evolving, how is the buildup of fission fragments occurring, how is corrosion happening and building up uh, you know, materials in the salt. And so under, if we can monitor the salt, we got a health of the reactor in lots and lots of ways. And you can physically sample the salt. We will physically take a sample of the salt out. And now it's going to be radioactive, right? The, the salt will be the most radioactive thing. And so if we can just physically take a smaller sample, then we can get a, a much, much lower radiation level in it. Can I step past the yellow line? Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is those concrete blocks, and that's the whole purpose of these is to give us a nice floor to walk on and, and, and work in here. Um, and these are the you know these are just concrete shielding blocks we can lower in place or, or be taken out uh, depending on where we want it. So. Is the test reactor going under our feet, or is it going in that space there? Yeah, so it'd be down here at this end. Is the is the plan is to actually put the, the reactor enclosure at this end, so it'd be down here uh, um, under my feet. These concrete blocks right now are kind of so nobody just falls in a hole. The biggest hazard out here is someone falling in the hole. It's 25 feet deep and so uh, you have to be careful about it. So keep it covered with concrete blocks or put the railing around it. Remember we came through two locked doors to get here and one set of doors was also propped open. So there's really three <laughs> doors that you have to, sets of doors you come through. So this is not a public open space. Uh, today we'll open it up for the public and allow them to come through but certainly in the future that will not be the case. How long ago did you guys realize that we can do this by starting to build the facility first? First, like was there yeah. a uh, was there a holy cow moment? 2019, uh, dropping into the NRC uh, offices um, in DC. We care about timing and schedule, right? It does us know we don't want to think about a 40-year project so we get a research reactor, you know, in 2070 or something like that. This possibility came up. Well, how did it come up though? Like, did the NRC t say to you, "Hey, you can do this," or were you guys looking through the regulation and you're like, "Hey, check this out"? Like, uh, a discussion about possible ways of doing it, and so yeah, I think it was actually a man that uh, works for us that said, "Hey." Um, um, this is a possibility and and so then we said hey in, in nuclear regulatory commission do we understand this guidance properly is this an option and they're like well let us look and see how it's been used before and they start investigating and no one's ever used it before we had multiple discussions with nuclear regulatory commission we're going to build a building and we'd like it to be classified as pre-existing are we all on the same page that that works and um, and and yes the safety features of the building or what's important to the in Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And so as long as the building is built in that quality manner we talked about earlier and it meets those safety functions, do the walls around us have to stay up to keep the reactor safe? 
No. Something disaster happens, natural, man-made, and one of these walls collapses. That's not what keeps the reactor safe. As long as the concrete box is intact, that's what keeps the reactor safe. And by safe, I mean, are we able to control reactivity? Are we able to contain radioactive material? And can we remove the decay heat um, when it's shut down? And so those are sort of three things. If you do those, then your reactor is safe. You look at any accidents, one of those three things, they sort of get you. Um, if we can it's right, can we remove the decay heat? Well, when you lose power, and when you lose backup power, and you know, and you're gonna find yourself in an in a earthquake followed by a tsunami, uh, do you have the backup power necessary to remove the decay heat? They didn't, and so that's where they got too warm. It's a low enough thermal energy output that natural conduction will allow it to radiate into the concrete mass around it. It's a low energy, and so that's part of a research reactor, is it's just a low power reactor. Uh, the other thing is, can we control the reactivity we drain the core, grab, as long as gravity works, the, fuel, the salt will drain out of the core and the fuel with it. Uh, also, with its highly negative temperature coefficient of reactivity, right, which means that if for whatever reason the temperature goes up, it automatically wants to shut down the power. So it, it, there's a natural way of shutting down the reactor. Um, and then the, the third thing is, can we contain the radioactive material? And, and so we started with this big concrete box. And so if we're t if, as long as the radioactive material stays inside the concrete box, then the radiation is not getting out of it. Um, and so does the radioactive material stay there? Yes. It's mostly captured inside the salt. And so again, well, I'll, I'll reference the design up here is that this is like a nested doll configuration. Again, something David Holcomb talked about is the layers of containment. And so we have the primary system, which is the, the loop that circulates the salt. It's all surrounded by a thermal management system, which is stainless steel lined catch pan, basically an oven. And then all that is surrounded by a pressure vessel or a reactor enclosure. And that whole system is put inside the concrete box. And so those different layers ensure the radioactive material, even in worst case scenario, would be contained. He mentioned specifically tritium. And because I speak to other guys that want to build reactors, nobody building a reactor seems worried about tritium. And then Holcomb seemed like, oh, how? Yeah, well, and you know, there's a lot of challenges if we want to scale and deploy in mass. Are we able to build things economically that compete in the marketplace? And that's a different question than technically does it work, right? I mean, I think Oak Ridge proved in the 1960s that molten salt liquid fuel reactors work because they had one they operated for four years. But it's a question of how long can it operate before corrosion becomes a concern? Another concern is tritium. Tritium is produced in a lot of natural processes, in particular in our design. Lithium absorbs a neutron, decays, and produces tritium. And tritium is one of those annoying radioactive materials, right, that doesn't have a half-life that's in the billions of years, so it's, it's basically stable, and it's not a half-life of a few milliseconds, so it decays rapidly. It's in the year's time zone, right? So it's the type of thing that if it gets into the environment, it sort of hangs out for a while. And tritium is, is hydrogen, an isotope of hydrogen, and so hydrogen can move around. Hydrogen is a slippery little atom, and it can slip through a lot of barriers, including metal barriers, especially metal barriers at high temperature. You've got lithium-7, so you're producing less than if you had an unenriched lithium. That's right. How do you get the lithium-7? Well, we, our, our plan is to use the same enriched lithium-7 that Oak Ridge used in the 60s. They still have that fly. That's right. We want to recycle that old fly that's been sitting at Oak Ridge. They've been, they've been trying to throw it out for years. And in fact, David Holcomb is sort of a champion and said, no, that's valuable. Let's not throw that out. Um, and so, so we've raised our hand and said, we'd like that. In fact, that was what we talked to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission before we committed this project is, hey, we need two things. We need help getting enriched uranium fuel for a research tractor like you do for every other research tractor and lithium enriched flybe that's sitting at Oak Ridge that you've been trying to throw out. And so those are the two things we said we needed. And that's what, you know, in 2019, when they gave us a programmatic letter of support saying, we support you on this, um, you move forward and we're going to put you in the, the research tractor infrastructure program, just like all the other university research tractors in the nation. That's when Naturo stood up to fund this project and ACU said, let's start thinking about designing a building. And so that's sort of when we started thinking about facility and and um, and started the process of what would this look like. Just an interesting different take on it. Thomas from Copenhagen Atomics, he's like, ah, oh, we're going to isotopically separate our own lithium. And I was talking to Stephen Boyd last night and he's like, I want to isotopically separate our own lithium. So it's like, great, you have a source for that, but it's um, 
it's like I was just kind of um, I was wondering it's like oh are you guys gonna make your own <laughs> lithium too it's like if that's a thing it seems like it's a thing I mean Kairos is planning on using Flybe and they have invested in their own salt production facilities it's something that we need I mean we need for this one reactor and we have a source for it um, Natura thinking about commercial deployment if they're going to continue down this path then yes there needs to be a commercial like any commodity if we're going to make it out of 316H or we're going to make it out of Inconel the metal then we need to make sure there's a supply for that if we're going to use graphite as a moderator is there a commercial vendor that will provide the quality and the, the quantity that we need moving forward and uh, or pumps or valves or sensors I, all these things are of course of interest and so you either need to be able to buy them off the shelf or else you need to bring them in-house or you need to modify your technology to work around it. Do you have any, uh, like a, a pump, like you're not building your own pumps? We have done a lot of stuff and that's in the labs and, um, and across the way, so that's proprietary. We're not going to, and, and just so you and I are on the same page, yeah. as soon as people start showing up, this whole zone is a no camera zone. Okay. Okay, cool. And I might not have cameras for the rest of the tour, possibly. As soon as people start showing up, which is at nine o'clock or however early they are, then we're going to go, we're going to be a good example. We're not going to let them see us filming okay. today, um, just to just make it clear. See some heads that we're poking. Yeah. Probably staff members and moving, uh, the offices are up there, so they've come in and they're probably getting things ready for today. Uh, there was a couple people that uh, said they might show up a few minutes early. Maybe we should move to an office or outside spot if you want to continue interviewing. So this is, you know, this is the public viewing window right off the lobby. It's a public place where you can look and see what's going on. It's on a college campus. What we're doing is not a secret. We've done everything we can to tell the neighbors about what we're doing here. We also want to have a chance to bring them in and see as much as possible, but we have to make sure we keep them safe. So out of the labs where there's potential hazards, but the lobby and this ability to come up here and peer down into this research bay is something that hopefully will, will allow people to see what we're doing and from a very safe vantage point. This would be exactly the kind of thing I would would want in any actor in Canada I'd be like please can we have this kind of accessibility now remember when the reactors in here functioning you're gonna see a concrete lid on it right yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so but you know again we'll, we'll what kind of uh, human activity would be in here? People are still going to mill around or? Well, uh, w w when it's being set up and commissioned, there'll be people milling around everywhere. When you get ready to, to operate it, you button it up and make sure there's this nice concrete box around it to keep the radiation out. And so as long as the concrete box is, in, is intact, then yes, people could, could still be in and around. You, you'd, it's not a place to loiter, right? If there's no yeah. reason to be there, then don't be there. But if there's a need to, then yes, it's still safe. To, to come and go. And the real thing is a cylinder. Think of it's basically a cylinder that's 10 foot diameter and 20 foot high. And that's the stainless steel box that everything, all the radioactive material goes inside of. We call it our reactor enclosure. And inside the reactor enclosure then is that thermal management system, which is the sort of double lined thing that just circles, uh, circulates everything. That is the, the reactor thermal management system. It's an oven, essentially. That, that's that's keeping everything inside warm because remember we're using molten salt and at room temperature it's a solid mm -hmm. so step one is keep it on get it hot so let's raise the temperature up to 550 degrees or something like that so we're well above the, the melting point so everything's a liquid so, wait are you transporting it with the salt in it or are you so the salt pouring it in gets made off site comes gets installed we'll then melt the salt and put it in it but it can be in a cold shut down state with fueled salt inside of it. So when we transport it, let's leave the salt out, let's leave the fuel out, right? Just again, if there's some sort of accident or something, it's nice to have them separate. ACU probably has a uh, journalism course or something like that. Um, can you get the journalism students uh, security cleared that they can cover this on a regular basis? Like, is there any way you could kind of reality TV this or get a steady stream of updates? Um, it's an interesting question. I haven't gone there exactly. I mean, I give lots of interviews to student organizations, you know, over the last five years, whether it's student newspaper or the, the student run radio program or TV programs, but haven't thought about in the future when we have a license, could we get some of them so they could come through the boundary and, you know, and take sort of front line. One of the goals here is that you don't have to trust somebody to go and do it, but you're able to actually see it with your own eyes, right? So obviously 
obviously this space out here is designed to what's going on in there. Let me tell you the story of the history of it, of sort of what we're doing, the reason why we're doing it. That's sort of these three panels along here, the mock-up of the, the reactor sitting there so you can sort of see it. But also, if, if, if you look through the, the doors here to, to my left, you see what we refer to as our training control room. The same panels laid out. So the idea is if you have a middle school class that wants to know what you're doing at this facility, you could take them in there. You don't have to get them all licensed and go behind. There's a window that appears in the research bay. There's the monitors there they are monitoring. So you can get a really, really good idea of what's going on inside and nobody is in a facility where you touch a button anything goes wrong or anything like that's safe for them. You don't have to rely on a, a journalist with a special permission to go and look behind the veil. Hopefully the veil is parted and, and everyone can see it. There's kind of a, a little gap in the, in the coverage you're describing there where it's like, yeah, you're, you're super public in so many respects, but um, it's kind of like um, just following the, the people through the, the journey, right? Like um, they don't even have to have a special clearance. It's just like the, the concept that this is probably going to be a, a historic project in retrospect and uh, to follow it along as it goes like I mean if I lived in this city I'd be nagging you all the time and on the other hand there's like journalist students journalism students here that uh, so long as they're aware of what's happening they might kind of get in your space more. I don't know that if you're saying that not every student here is aware that this is a molten salt reactor, um, it, very new to this world, it's like um, they might just glom on to you, and I hope they would. <laughs> yeah. No, I certainly, as we talked earlier, I think that, I think virtually every student on the ASU campus understands this is a, a, a reactor, is the, is the purpose for this building, is to build an advanced reactor. Do would they use the words molten salt to describe it or talk about thorium? I think there's chances they're slim. Um, so I think there's a high chance that they know this is this is that nuclear product next lab. How far down the technology development is how curious they are. And so there'll be plenty of students that uh, I, I got it. Is there any yeah. protests or any crazies <laughs> going outside sometimes? Not, it's a great question and we have been extremely proactive in telling people what we're doing. We've done a lot of open houses. Um, when we were building this building, literally the week after they stood up the walls and it went from being a flat construction to 50 foot high walls in a couple days. The next week we had an open house, hey, what are we building, come talk to us. And a presentation of what we're doing and a Q&A dialogue. We submitted a construction permit for this, so the city wanted to know what was going on. And I'll say also the Development Corporation of Abilene is actually partial funder of this facility uh, because they believe if we stand up a research center here, it's going to have long-term economic impact on the city of Abilene. You have to talk to them, the city council, or the mayor, or the city manager. Uh, people have to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and how it's actually going to make the city a better place. So I've spoken to lots of Rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, Tuesday morning men's Methodist prayer breakfast. Anybody that invites me, I go and talk to them. And so the city is actually, I would say, pretty well informed about what's going on here. So finally, to get to your question, <laughs> a good question of, has anyone protested this? No. no Nobody has. The only concerns we've had is that this physical site used to be the intramural fields for the school. And so there were some students concerned about where their intramural fields are going. So the university has you know nicer, newer fields on the north side of campus for them. But uh, that was a concern for some people. Going through the regulatory process with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, there are there are points where they put out for public input or public comments and so we've had a, a couple of times in those meetings where someone from uh, Dallas or from New York or from Santa Fe will get on and say is it going to be safe what about all the earthquakes that are happening in Texas or you know what are you going to do with the waste and you know and so we, we answer them politely but they're not they're not a local concern they're a you know they're a career anti-nuclear we were looking at can do in Alberta and yeah people traveled across the globe to tell, come and tell us how dangerous nuclear power was you appreciate them stimulating the local economy by traveling to, and being a tourist <laughs> beginning I did a demographic study where they went all around the world and they pulled all these people about different names for new nuclear reactors mm -hmm. and what they found was, was that SMR small modular reactor did not have a good perception what they settled on was new nuclear new nuclear is what we're calling this thing okay yeah. <laughs> that seems to be a term that hits well that resonates well with the public 
Yeah. What we're doing is not like what we used to do, right? I mean, and we're used to that. I mean, a great example is that phone, right? I mean, you go back 50 years, sure. uh, what was a phone, right? What I remember my grandmother using, right? The old put up to your ear and crank it, right? Her phone number was two longs and a short, right? I mean, that's what I remember my grandmother's phone. Um, this is not anything, we, we don't use 50 year old technology anywhere in our lives. Yeah. Why are we using it for pro producing, you know, 20% of our nation's clean energy? It's pretty easy to convey the fear in, you know, three words with a, a, an image or something, but to really communicate the, the opportunity there, the value, it takes more of a dialogue. And that's, you know, that's, that's the challenge of getting people to, to sit down and listen for a while. Sure. Can I ask where the um, heat exchanger goes to? Like, what's the ultimate end of the heat you're creating with the, the one megawatt thermal? The ultimate heat sink here is the air around us. Not as bad as you might think because this is a research reactor and it's not designed to be turned on and run forever. Let's just barely make it go critical at one watt, right? It's not even produced enough energy to keep it molten. We still have to have the electric heaters on around it, but it went critical and we can study and learn from it. It might be a year before we ever get it to full power because we want to be very close and deliberate going up. And when we get it to full power, very, very likely we, we, we go to full power for a few minutes and turn it off. We can't harness it for any practical purpose because it would be so intermittent. So intermittent that there's no poor purpose there and even at full power and if you were most efficient it's not like there's a huge amount of energy there. Th this is not designed to be a large thermal generator. You're pooping on my swimming pool idea. I'm not <laughs> we've, we've had some other ideas we've had you know a lot of you know in West Texas we've had a lot of people you know can, well can you barbecue with that good thermal energy and other ideas like that which you know resonate to me you know we just, we, how long you need it 12 hours hours for a brisket, can we leave the thing on for 12 hours? Even if there was no practical thing happening with it, it might be interesting, something where it's like if a thing is warm. We're a university, right? You got lots of uh, faculty members, you got lots of students, and so there's lots of ideas, and maybe more serious than a pool or barbecue, of what, what could we do to that thermal energy that would totally be decoupled, right? What, let's go to the vent on the side of the building where that thermal energy comes out, and let's put where that blows, let's put something there just to demonstrate the ability to convert thermal energy into electricity even if it's you know it it it's a simple demo toy to come down and put a light down there right it, it, that light on at the bottom is it, we're, you know it demonstrates the principles and students have projects and so there's ideas that will be there I don't think we'll do anything coupled tightly that would put at risk our ability to get a license for it right and put, there's a lot of restrictions about a research reactor you can't produce electricity hook it up to grid and things like that I guarantee you quantify the heat rejected with instrumentation and, you know, you'll, you'll know the BTUs. Oh, right, 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 right. Absolutely. You know, we, we will have flow rate of the, the air and the temperature, inlet and outlet temperature and stuff. Like any nuclear reactor, there is an instrumentation control for it, right? And, and that's what is get, gets licensed, right, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is how do you instrument it so you know what state it's in and how do you control it? In addition to all of those instruments, we're scientists and engineers, we're going to have what we refer to as our scientific surveillance layer all over it, right? So we collect all the information. And I'll say that information is also what Natura wants, so they understand how it operates and so they can make the commercial version of it more efficient. Anywhere you can reduce the margins, let's do, take advantage of that. And so we'll instrument it like crazy to collect that data. This is extremely interdisciplinary. A lot of people refer to it as a chemist reactor. When we started making our very first loop, we formed an interdisciplinary team because I went over to Dr. Pamplin standing over there who was chair of the chemistry department I said you know I'm a nuclear physicist we want to build this reactor we need chemistry involved with here do you think any of your faculty would enjoy working on this project this summer with me and he said oh yeah let me talk to him and when we partner with University of Texas and Texas A&M and Georgia Tech th those are amazing schools so thankful for them we wouldn't be here without them I've never met a chemist from any one of those schools all we do is work with their nuclear engineers, right? They're so, so big, for them an interdisciplinary project is when someone from the Department of Nuclear Engineering that is a simulations expert, talks to somebody who's an instrumentation controls expert or a non-proliferation expert, but they're all nuclear engineers, right? Yeah. The idea of someone from chemistry, well, I don't know where they are, right? That's a different college, a different part of campus, and uh, we don't talk to them. We're engineers. They're, they're scientists. But one of the first educations I got about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is in the beginning, we were talking about this as a research and test reactor okay. because we're going to do research and we're going to test things. So according to Webster, this is a research and test reactor. Uh, early on, talking to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we said we're building a research and test 
test tractor. And they said, well, which? A research or test tractor? I said, yes. And they're like, no, no, no. Go, go read the rules and, and then tell us which one you're doing. They have very definite definition of research and test for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Department of Energy uses different language, so it depends on who you're talking to. We're building a research reactor according to the definition by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And I think that's why you got fuel, because if you were a commercial enterprise, oh, you wouldn't necessarily have fuel. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you're a commercial reactor, right, if you're Bill Gates' TerraPower and you want to build a, a you know a fast sodium cooled reactor, yeah. you got to go buy that and find a source for it. Now the inverted world that's happened over the last few years is Department of Energy says we want to put a billion dollars in that project that Bill Gates is doing. Well, that's going to fail if we don't provide him fuel. So now all of a sudden it's our problem to get them fuel. Over the last couple years, oh, there's a war in Ukraine, there's a shortage of fuel, and we have this billion dollar project that we need to make sure we have fuel for. Uh, Evelyn Christian, we might not have fuel for you. Oh, and so uh, time out. The fuel we need and the fuel they need are different. And, and this was literally day one. Very first day, we're at, in, in Washington, D.C. with the Department of Energy, and they ask us, you know, what do you need? What's your plan to, de to develop the technology? We want to build a research tractor. What do you need? We need you to provide fuel for us. And they said, what type? And can we have a meeting this afternoon to talk about where it comes from? And literally that afternoon, we came up with three different sources. One of them is to take their supply of high enriched uranium and down blend it. Another is they just signed $120 million contract with Centris to develop some enriched uranium. And the other one was the source that's the most likely source, which is an old decommissioned reactor at Idaho, the experimental breeder reactor that used high enriched uranium as its fuel. And they're in the process of recovering that high enriched uranium and down blending it. But it's been slightly used and it has a few different radioactive isotopes mixed in with it. And so if you're trying to build a new reactor with solid fuel and you want to know the exact pristine condition of your fuel to start with, you can't use that. So none of these advanced reactor companies that want to use solid fuel, whether they're using salt as a coolant or some other coolant, none of them are able to use that. But the point was, is we identified this, you know, five years ago, as this is the most obvious source. It's an asset or a liability on their books. It meets our needs. It doesn't meet anybody else's. Nobody else wanted it. And so at that day, we just we eyeballed it. And I still think that's where we'll end up getting it. Do you think uh, this development will unlock the future molten salt reactors in the state? Will the NRC will be able to light? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's been over 80 technical reviewers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission looking at what we're doing. And that's more than the reviewers that were on the Kairos reactor. And so the point is, is they're trying to understand this is the first liquid fueled molten salt cooled reactor. And they've had lots of people looking at it, educating themselves. So the second one go around, it should be much, much more efficient to go through. People have said that it can take a, a billion US dollars to get a new reactor license right through the NRC. University research reactors, they get a review from the NRC at the NRC's expense. They don't bill, they don't bill ACU for looking at our construction rate. When, uh, you know, ter terrestrial energy or Terra Power submit their construction remits, they get a bill for every hour of engineering time looking at it. So that's where you get new scale saying we've spent about a billion dollars, you know, rounding error, a billion dollars trying to get our small light water reactors approved. Once we got a good design, the, the, the construction company said, yeah, 18 months, we can pull this off, and they came in under that. So it's, it's you know, on one hand, it's an awesome building and facility. The, the other thing we've learned from it is it doesn't have to take 15 years, right? Yeah. So we can do it faster than Vogel. To welcome you to Abilene Christian University, uh, our president, President uh, Phil Schubert is here. I'll let him say a few words. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Abilene, Texas. How many of you first time here? Most of you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we are so proud at ACU for the work that's going on right here in Next Lab. How many of you are faculty at another institution teaching? So few, smattering. I get a request from Rusty Tao and Dr. Tim Head, these guys, to come and, and have lunch. And I'm thinking, what in the world are these guys want with the president? Uh, so we go have lunch, and they proceed then to explain this grand idea that they have about this technology that was pioneered in the 60s with something called a molten salt reactor that was actually turned on and run live for four or five years. With this technology brought to the current age, we could revolutionize 
energy production consumption. Oh, by the way, we can make these things called medical isotopes that are used profoundly across the country and around the world to treat cancer every year. Oh, and we can also get clean water out of the deal. And so we just need a little money, Dr. Schubert, to make this vision a reality. So if this is so great, all these things you've said, why hasn't someone already done it? Yeah. Right. And they looked at each other with like this blank stare, like they'd never thought of that. <laughs> and Dr. Talbot said, I don't know. They just forgot about it. Put it in the closet. So I take them to a, a meeting of a group called the President's Venture Council, which had a bunch of VIP high-level donors. And I let them make a presentation on the same idea. And guess who was sitting in the audience but retired oil and gas executive Doug Robison, who also had a great appreciation and some understanding of what nuclear could do. And he came up to Rusty after the presentation. And I'm, I'm seeing this uh, crazy faculty member with one of my big donors in the back of the room, and I'm making a beeline run to try to intervene. I get there just in time to hear Doug say to Rusty, what could you do if you were fully funded? And I knew right then and there, we were on to something. I had to ask great. that question three times. <laughs> uh, but everything that's taken place since then uh, has just been a product of hard work, of determination, of resolve, resiliency to stay the course. We are convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this technology is going to prove itself and that we're going to be on to unleashing a new age of advanced nuclear for the benefit of the world. I'm going to invite Doug Robison, who, as you know, is the founder of Natura. I was retiring. I came out of retirement, lasted about seven months. My wife has asked me from time to time if I had known what this was going to become, would I have ever gotten out of my chair and gone and talked to Dr. Tao in the back of the room? I said, well, it's too late for that now. So <laughs> we're past that point. I made a point yesterday, and I want, to, I want to emphasize it today because you're going to see part of it. This project is, the success is ultimately determined by the joint ventures and partnerships that we enter into. The, the initial partnership was between myself and Dr. Schubert, and maybe between Dr. Schubert and Dr. Tal and Dr. Head, who is back there. If y'all haven't met Dr. Head, the head of engineering here. And then ACU partnering with the University of Texas at Texas A&M and Georgia Tech and bringing that coalition together. Now, Natura working with Zachary Engineering, Zachary Nuclear, and so forth. But one of the, one of the partners you're gonna see here, and Thomas Jan Peterson with, with Copenhagen Atomics is an example of that. We really appreciate you being here. I think the next place you should meet, John, is in Denmark at their facilities. Uh, they, they are building stuff as well. And, uh, and I tell you, Thomas, we, we, on your website or a video, we saw the photography and how you present your material. We, we are inspired by that. And we actually use that as kind of a, can make us look as, try to make us look as cool as Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> are doing? You're going to see a, a salt handling system. The salt that's going in that, I think it's already there, but it's not in, is from Co Copenhagen. Nice. That's a partnership across the ocean and uh, exciting to be here. So you're going to see this building as a proof of performance. This is the other. This is two years of work by all four universities. This is our application, 600 pages, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for our construction permit, which we expect to have approved August, September of this year. It, it's not as impressive as a building, but this is really important wow. that we got this work done. So there's some success at all different. The assistant lab director here is Dr. Tim Head, He's also in charge of our salt system. Dr. Lester Tal is our manager of our licensing process. Dr. Kim Pamplin is a director of chemistry here. Hope you enjoy the tour. Thank you. Thank you.